Hello. Nice Hi. to see you. Yes, yeah. it's very nice to see you too. Vic, or should I say Victoria Watson? No, um, whichever, whichever comes. <laughs> so, um, just for those guys at home, I'll just explain to you. This is Victoria Watson. She's a friend of mine. We've known each other since school days, and we won't we won't mention how many years that is, but it's enough. Um, <laughs> we went to her house before prom. Also, so we've known each other a long time. Now, Vic has a little boy who is. Five. Is he five? Yes. Yes. He's five now, yeah. Yeah. Five, yeah. Bobby. Um, but you've had a bit of a rough time. It's not been the normal five years, has it, that people no. experience when they have babies. So um should we start from the beginning? Can you tell me a little bit about sort of when you got pregnant with Bobby, when you realised things were a bit different? And what? Um, I don't think I ever had a moment where in pregnancy I realised anything was different. I think like my pregnancy went too well really. I mean I've always been told I had fertility issues so when I actually got pregnant naturally with Bobby it was kind of like oh how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> well obviously we know how it happened but um, <laughs> you know obviously obviously like yay you know it's, it's, it's great and then I got to kind of 20, I must have been about 24 point I don't know, 24.5 days, something like that. Um, and it was the Wednesday, started having some really odd feelings um, and just thought, oh, something's not right. So uh, generally because obviously you don't want to come over as kind of a pregzilla, do you really? You don't want to be like an over neurotic <laughs> new pregnant person who's just like every bump feeling you know so I kind of went to the midwife I was that person <laughs> the amount of times I was in that antenatal clinic like well, I can't feel them no the fine you know, go home for anybody that kind of knows me I'm like really neurotic about the small things and then like the big things I'm just kind of like yeah all right so I kind of was just like this doesn't feel right but what do I do am I being to think everyone was telling me that it's just Braxton Hicks and I was like really I didn't know we had never been pregnant before so uh, and uh, and so I went to the midwife they were like oh you're stretching it's just stretching you know you've had some gyne issues so I'm like all right okay um so I went into work on the Friday woke up on the Friday morning and had what I know I don't know a bit of a bleed sorry if there's guys listening not so great but um bit of a bleed is this two um, days after you first started feeling what you thought were Braxton yeah here? so this was like the Wednesday so this is now the Friday um went into work and I just felt rubbish I felt very something wasn't right I'd had a bit of a bleed people were telling me it was normal and I was like this just isn't normal so anyway so took myself off to spoke to the early pregnancy unit and I was like something's not right so they asked me so I actually drove myself to hospital um uh, from work um rung my mum as as I do um and said mum do you fancy come sitting with me in the assessment unit because I'm a bit bored I was in a side room um, I was laughing and joking with my mum. Um, my partner at the time was at home, um, kind of like, every up, you know, we've, we've got to, it's takeaway night because it was a Friday. So, you know, so we were just nothing fine. To cut a long story short, um, I'd been having basically contractions from probably, I would probably say probably from the Wednesday, to be honest. And it was now Friday, but I didn't know there were contractions. About eight o'clock in the evening Friday evening and I was like something's not right I'm having these movements every two hours and I feel like there's still blood coming out I'm, I'm a bit concerned um they came in and basically sorry guys if there's any guys listening or women that are a bit kind of uh, squeamish basically my cervix had opened and my membranes were bulging so basically Bobby was the, coming out the waters hadn't broken at that waters at that hadn't point. broken nothing like that and stuff so um, panic stations were everything. So basically I was then bed bound. I wasn't allowed to get off the bed. Effectively my waters were, were hanging out. Um, so they whipped me onto the labour unit. And I think for anybody, um, it's, it's, I think you just kind of go through like a surreal. I don't know whether I can explain it, I suppose. You know, like when you're watching one of them... Um, cartoons and they're doing a chase and it, everything's going really quick behind you that's kind of what it was because everything was just going really quickly because we were on the labor unit we were having 
people coming to speak to us and they were like, we're going to have your baby. And I was like, you didn't have enough time to process it. So at this stage, I was only 25 weeks pregnant. So I was like, I can't have a baby. I'm 25 weeks pregnant. Like, this is just I'm ridiculous. Not the what we gonna do? So, oh, yeah, yeah. So you're just like, you've not gone to antenatal classes. You know, you've not kind of, I'd only literally just got my bump. So, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of just, it was crazy, really. Um, so there we were in the labour ward uh, on a labour bed. I'm now on a tilt. So my head's basically on the floor. My legs are doing because the plan is to stop my contractions. Is that what they do? They put your head down and put your feet yeah, so they put the Yeah, so they put me on a tilt. So the, the idea was to stop my contractions by giving me a drug called nifedipine, um, which they gave, I think they give that for 24, 48 hours, which are meant to stop your contractions. Um, effectively, they were trying to get my membranes back in and then they were going to stitch me up. And basically, I was then going to be on bed rest and bed bound till 30 weeks when they were going to then take the stitch out and let nature take its course. But they just wanted, obviously, Bobby to stay in for a bit longer to obviously um develop lung develop and everything they give you steroids so they give you two injections they give you one i had two injections one on the friday night and one on the saturday morning which uh steroids the steroids there kind of start to develop bobby's chest and they start to they help with like the breathing and the lungs and stuff so it was it was really surreal because things are happening things were being told um, and you know you, out yeah. of your control as well yeah you can't do anything you just can't do anything because you're desperate to keep this baby in and every minute hour you know every time you get a movement everything you're you're panicking because you're thinking I mean and then you kind of then start things like for me I was like well what how do I go to the toilet you know and then like say that what what what, you need a poo like you just be well this this, this is it because obviously you know I mean I mean after a certain time that that was my my exact thing like what the hell am I going to do if I need to go for a poo? You know, because like effectively, I'm, oh, wait, wait, I'm gonna, wait, wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically, I'm gonna basically eject my child. So you know, there was kind of there was all these things going things. So, um, I mean, for any parent that ever goes through this, do not Google anything. Like Google's just Bobby came out at twenty five uh, plus five weeks, and although there was eighteen people in my delivery, so there was a team working on me getting out. There was a team waiting for Bobby to be there so they could deal with whatever condition Bobby came out with. And then he went into a transporter where he then got taken down to the neonatal intensive care unit. And were you in the um, same hospital? Like, just so- Yes, luckily, luckily, yes, I was. Um, Bobby was born in Oldham. Um, there was a time, um, a, a, a talk about moving me to North Manchester, but because my uh, m- membranes were bulging, they were so fragile, they couldn't risk transporting me at that point. So luckily, Bobby managed to get a, a bed in in the NICU unit. Um, so I think. So then obviously there was this big hullabaloo, blue. Bobby's here. You'd expect them to come out head first. Bobby didn't. He came out feet first. And although Bobby was was um looked very odd because he looked like basically like a a, a featherless chick. He was very skinny, he was very it was he, he didn't look like a baby, he looked kind of like an alien, I suppose. But there were still two arms, there were still two legs, there were still two eyes, there was still a nose, a mouth, and you know, there was still a baby there. Um so there was absolutely nothing to push. So anybody that goes with the myth of, oh, you know, they were only, I mean, Bobby was one pound 10 when he was born. So he was tiny. Um, you know, he was like, he probably could have sat on your hand. Um, and anybody that kind of says, oh, it was easy. It was one pound 10. No, try pushing a one pound 10 child out. So with the, there's, but there's nothing to push. <laughs> Cause he's, you know, with his feet, with his feet, you know, the, the other way was his feet, you know, there was nothing to push. Um, so you know there was so yeah so out, out he came to the world um and I probably I, I don't even really remember seeing Bobby really I just remember seeing this transporter come over to me and these two black eyes looking at me and then he went um so and then everybody went and there was just me in a bed <laughs> with everybody gone uh no baby and so were you put on to the postnatal ward then or were you taken down so, yeah, I mean, I don't, Oldham was amazing and I don't, uh, you might want to take this out um, when you when you look at it, but um, yes, I was put onto a postnatal ward and um, so 
it was it was emotionally difficult because I'm basically on a ward with other mums who have had babies. babies. So you can hear crying babies, you can hear the balloons, the laughter, the joking, and then you're in a room on your own with no baby. So it's it's um it's a it's a weird, weird, weird experience, I suppose, because you kind of you know, I, I was in hospital for two weeks in total when I first had Bobby. Um I I was in obviously in while well, I was in labour with Bobby and then um when mums have um babies early, um you get so many days um to stay in the hospital, probably longer than you would if you had a baby um under not if they were born at term. Um because obviously you're there in the hospital and stuff and there's things like you're learning to to express, you're learning to do different things. Um, yeah, so and also, at that stage, did your milk come in then? So like, Yeah, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, didn't even, I didn't even think it would come in. So a breastfeeding um, specialist came in and she was like, do you want to try and express? And I was like, huh? I was like, can I, have I even got milk? So, but apparently as soon as your baby's born or whatever you, or whenever you're pregnant, you start producing. So they showed me how to get my milk to come. Um, and at first I was just kind of, I was actually expressing myself. So you feel like a big cow, you know, you feel like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> others and, you, and you're expressing yourself, you know. You um, like, like a you know. Little tiny little mill and you're yeah, like yeah you get like this the clostrum is it the clostrum so you've got this like little tiny syringe and you're trying to you're trying to get it in and you're trying to like suck off the clostrum and you're thinking god and because it's the only thing you can do because you 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 know you've you've for, for a mum um you know you've basically you've had your baby early so you've lost that whole pregnancy so you're mourning for the pregnancy that you didn't have you can't do anything so you can't wash change feed do anything for your baby so breastfeeding is the only thing you can do you know so I kind of got like and also you've just had a baby so you can imagine you've got a mum who's just had a baby who's emotional hormones are everywhere who's then trying to literally get every drip last drip out of their boob so it's just it's a bit of an emotional nightmare if I'm being honest um yeah. and so yeah so I managed to do it and then they brought in a pump and showed me how to start pumping so then you would feel more of a cow because you literally sat there with with both boobs out and you're like pumping electrical pumping um and um yeah so so I started expressing milk um but unfortunately I also got my status boobs the size out here like literally it was just and but you couldn't touch them they were hot they were horrible you know you couldn't you couldn't go near them expressing them excruciating so yeah it was it was really nice <laughs> you've got all this and you can't you can't even latch a baby on I remember no I, you, you, I remember going through the pain of it with my two I, I had mastitis both times because it like just took ages for to get into the routine with breastfeeding and um I remember that pain when they would latch on was just absolute agony, but you knew that it was doing what it needed to do because that was what needed to happen. It ne you needed to keep going with the milk supply and that must have been so hard with no baby there crying at you, you know, wanting yeah. milk. And yeah, just, it, it, it was a real, because the thing is as well, for you to produce milk, you rely on the smell of your baby, the touch of your baby, the you, you know, baby's cry. So all these things that people have naturally that help them produce milk, you, you don't have that. So you effectively have to, um, you know, there, there was ways and things that we used, I used to do to keep, keep my milk production up because then you become obsessed with it. it. It's not, it's not like, it's not like, you know, you become obsessed with it. So, you know, when people say don't cry over spilt milk, seriously, You've never been an expressing Niku mum who is not literally the best express she's got and it's just gone all over the counter. We came out of hospital after two weeks and that was my life, you know, um, yeah, every day. You did, but Bobby didn't, did he? Um, Bobby didn't leave hospital with me, no. Bobby spent 17 weeks in, in hospital in total between Oldham and uh, Manchester, Manchester uh, Children's Hospital. And what were your, like, so what was visiting like with him? Were you 
Uh, so neonatal intensive care unit is what it says it's an intensive care unit so you know just like you would into an adult intensive care unit you go in there's there's incubators there's machines there's there's bleeping there's doctors there's nurses it's a very clinical environment you have to wash your hands it's open visiting so I could go anytime day or night and they had a quiet time which was parents only um which I kind of had a hissy fit that's not like me is it at the time because my my mum at that point um Mark was obviously working uh quite a lot so my mum was the main person that came with me daily because when they go into an incubator they they basically falsify your wounds they do the best they can to keep that baby in a in a in a womb environment I suppose I think they used to ask you to leave um, for handover times, obviously because they were talking about other babies, which is fair enough. Um, and obviously there were certain times where uh, potentially maybe asked to leave um, if a baby was was really really poorly um, and stuff. But yeah, so there's there's but yeah, generally there was no specific visiting time as such. Why did you make friends with any other? Parents. I did, yeah, yeah. I mean, we did. You did talk, but I suppose your baby can be really stable one minute, and then the next minute they've completely dropped, and everybody's having to hands on deck. So it's very, it's a very roller coaster journey, and it is a roller coaster journey because there's lots of ups, there's lots of downs. Um, it's unpredictable. You know, you're desperate for somebody to say they're going to be okay, and you're going to be taking them home. But realistically, nobody can say that to you because. In the true, in the hard truth, reality, you know, it's not a given that you take your baby home. Bobby's um, a miracle story, if anything, really, because Bobby um, overcome so much in his NICU journey. journey, um, you know. But it, but it isn't a given, and I think that's the hard reality that parents have to face. Did you find yourself sort of at times? Because I know you, there was the time that he developed. Um, what was the condition? Neck, necrotizing enterocolosis, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, when you told me about that and I Googled that, I was like, oh my, oh, she's going to lose him. Oh, this is horrific. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. We'd, we'd, we'd been prepared for the worst with that. That was, I think Bobby was five weeks old at the time. So I think... How did you um, prepare, like, in that situation? What did, how did you... Uh, how did you it? Because, I, I mean, I, I know you and you've, taken to motherhood like a duck to water and it's just like <laughs> this is this is what you do and I'm fine and I just you astound me because you know my birth story and, and in comparison it's absolute walk in the park but I suppose maybe psychologically I I had quite a, a tough time with things how did you sort of wrap your head around things what did you spend time reading when you were sat there in NICU did you um, um speak to other mums were there like charities that you could talk to like did anyone yeah I mean I mean the one I think um when I started my NICU journey um there was one particular and they were just starting out at the time the very they've become a very well-known charity now called Spoons they're a parent run uh, charity so it's actually parents that have been through the NICU journey um, which is helpful because they know what it's like to go through and it's not just parents that you know necessarily have the same uh, their born, babies are born prematurely it's, it's any parents that have been in NICU it, you know it was it was a massive support to me a massive support to me it was someone to talk to but there are other supports out there there's there's places called Bliss um, there's support charities for neck um, so there's a neck awareness um group there's there's a group there for when you lose your babies through either being stillborn or in the prem so yeah there are, there are support groups but effectively the one support group that i had was spoons through my through my dude through my um journey and did you contact them or did they contact you on the um no well i think I, I think there was a poster up and I think the person that started it up came onto the unit and I grabbed her <laughs> um, and I just started talking to her. You know, they, they run groups uh, for people, um, you know, now so they run groups where children that have been on NICU who are out of hospital go and they meet up and they do meetups and stuff like that. They do all sorts. They do, they do, now they've obviously moved on, so they do sibling packs, they do all sorts of different things. They do um, 
special NICU. Um, so you get the packs where, you know, your baby's born, then the one month, two month and stuff. So the milestone cards, they do specific milestone cards for NICU oh, babies because obviously, you know, um, you know, there's, there's things in NICU that your baby does um, that you want to celebrate, you know. You want to treasure those moments. Like I've got Isabella's first little... Um, like the first little jug that they they had to like cup feed her when she was first born um, so they cup fed her formula and I've got the little cup that they did that in and I've got the little eye mask so it's when she went jaundice and then they put her under yeah, the yeah. light I've got the little eye mask still I've got my TED stocking but I think that's just a bit weird um, <laughs> but these are things that as new mums you want to keep don't you you just you, you want to mem- keep those memories and yeah uh, I mean I've got a massive case full of Bobby's stuff I've got little wires splints um that Bobby had what else have I got I've got um at one point they had to shave Bobby's head to get um line access um so they could give him meds and stuff like that and they kept his first head shavings for me because at that point I'd never seen well I'd never seen Bobby's head you know, that's because Bobby had a special hat on um, in, in NIQ. So I, I never actually saw Bobby. I never actually saw Bobby's head until I think he was, um, I think he was about three months old, two months old. But I actually, actually saw Bobby's head for the first time. What point did they say to you, we can take, you can take him home? And what was that? Um, uh, so Bobby was born on the 28th of April and we didn't take Bobby home till the 22nd of August. When they're getting near to that time, where they're getting ready to come home um they go into nursery um what's called nursery or whichever rooms like step down room i suppose for me it was kind of learning how to care for bobby because obviously for the last few weeks bobby's had wires machines you know um i mean i didn't actually physically hold bobby until he was six days old and even then I only held him for, I think, I think it was about two hours that I got to hold him for. And then he had to go back into the incubator. Um, and then even that's not normal because you've got, you've got the vent, you've got the ventilator tubes, you've got all the other tubes, you've got wires. I think I was like, it took probably about half an hour to get Bobby onto me. And they had to like microtape stuff on so I could keep everything there. And I just literally, he was just there. You know, it wasn't a normal, lovely skin on skin kind of hold that you'd expect it's very clinical everybody's there there's tubes there's wires there's machines bleeping there's you know but obviously that's 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 our norm when obviously Bobby was getting ready so there's things like you know his NG tube got taken out um well he pulled it out actually if I'm being honest Bobby pulled it out and stuff um you're learning then how to kind of either breastfeed or you start to bottle I feed love that that sign of his character even then <laughs> it was like oh yeah he did. he did all sorts he was it was a pickle it was a pickle I remember walking into the uh when he was in intensive care so he was still very tiny at this point and he had a ventilator he had his vent in and uh the nurse looking after him turned around. She was called Lauren, actually, I think. And the nurse turned around. She was just shaking and said, he's been a pickle this morning. And I said, why? She said, because he's pulled his ventilator tubes out twice. So I was like, oh, so he's been a really good boy this morning then. Bobby came home on home oxygen. Um, yeah, so we had to that get was the, him. the sort of big thing, wasn't it, that you just couldn't keep his sats up? Um... Yeah, I mean, we could have, there was, there was a choice. We could have stayed in hospital for another... 10 days two weeks and got him off oxygen or brought him home and I was like I want to come home now I want to bring my baby home so we'll come home because even if we'd have stayed in 10 days it wouldn't have guaranteed to get Bobby off off oxygen in that time so then you know how long is a piece of string so I would have rather have come home and got Bobby off the oxygen at home um, and stuff than actually spending over 10 days in hospital because I just wanted to come home but I say that but I think you've got to think like for 17 weeks I had Bobby was in hospital there was nurses there there was doctors there there was professionals there and then you come home and you're on your own and you've got this baby there's no nurses there's no doctors you've not been to your antenatal I never took an antenatal class I don't even know if an antenatal class would have been even helpful towards me um and you know you've kind of you're there and it's kind of 
I think that's when it hit me. I called it car seat day because it was just to get Bobby in a car seat and to actually be bringing him home is the most surreal, weird experience that I've ever, ever had. Um, you know, because we were kind of, I felt, I felt like I was stealing my own baby walking <laughs> down the corridors. Um, I think there's a picture of me like holding, I've got an oxygen tank in my back and I'm holding Bobby with a big smile on my face. And I was super happy, but I, I almost felt like I was, I was stealing my child from the I'm hospital because we yeah yeah it was just random um but before we came home we actually roomed in it's called rooming in so I actually stayed in the hospital they've got like a lovely I suppose like it's it's like a little a little there's like a double bed it's like it's really nice it's really homely and your baby comes in at night and then you can take it back onto the unit in the day or they can stay in there with you and even that you feel a bit weird really um so I roomed in for three days but after on reflection I didn't feel that was enough because I feel that when I got home I wasn't ready to manage, which which is weird because obviously I've been doing it, but I think that because you 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 get so used to having machines there, and you do get obsessed with the machines, you do get obsessed with the charts and everything, and it's you have to kind of block your mind out of it really and focus on on your child, and and you've got to look at him. Is he is he pink? Is he breathing? Is he you know you get you. It, you know there's so many things that go through your head and I think when I got home I actually that's when I fell apart I mean thank goodness I had people around me that were mega supportive um but yeah I think that's I think that's when I fell apart when I actually brought Bobby home which is really um, random I remember with Isabella um so my firstborn getting to the point I remember Neil saying to me Sarah you've got to stop now because I was so like you say like you get a bit fixated on certain things and mine was how much breast milk I could give her so because she'd been cup fed and then she was taking a bit of expressed milk from a bottle and then she was latching on and having some from me and I was being told oh you'll give her nipple confusion and she won't know what to do and I was probably knowing me really stubborn I'm gonna do it I'm gonna succeed but became absolutely obsessed with how many mills I was feeding her and I had yeah. to read myself off a chart with the times on and then how long she'd fed for. And even if she'd like come off for a couple of minutes, I counted that and she'd gone back on again for a few minutes. And so how many mils that would have been the equivalent of. And I remember having this chart and then I print off another chart because it was another week and I needed to do it again. And Neil was like, Sarah, Sarah you don't need to do that. She's she's feeding she's growing she's fine <laughs> you know like why are you doing that um I mean yes I can completely understand when you say that it was a different world I bet you almost became oh I need to be all these machines but at home I just I you just looked at him all the time it was like oh is he breathing okay is he breathing is it and my mum's like look at his colour Vic he's pink he's lovely and I'm like is he breathing I didn't enjoy Bobby being home for about the first month um I didn't feel that I was able to enjoy that time with him and, and to be fair we spent half our time back in the hospital anyway because we were going back for appointments left right and centre did you so they, they I know they said um I always remember with Isabella they said um that she should feed every four hours I think it was and I remember having a night where she'd slept for about 12 hours in a row and I was like oh I feel wonderful and the midwife checked in and and I said oh yes yeah, she's fed she's she's slept all night and they're like you need to feed your baby Sarah and this like <laughs> oh yeah that's probably what caused the paranoia to be honest I was like oh yeah I need to feed her so um yeah did they give you like a, a sort of a schedule like that did you have to feed him on the hour every hour or like how did that work so Bobby, uh, Bobby was a very NICU baby every two hours, like every, every clockwork every two hours. Um, and he stayed every two hours for ages. So every two hours he woke for a feed. So I don't think I've slept for five years, if I'm being honest. And then he kind of went to every every three hours and then he'd kind of wake up spread. So there was no, um, there was oh, a he routine. Was, he was like crying for it. He <laughs> was, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Religious, like, yeah, yeah. 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 Half an hour before his feed due, he was he was kicking off. He was, I want my feed mummy right now, right now, you know. I mean, I can't take the full credit for something because because I've I've had the most amazing support and my mum's been um, you know, because Mark Mark's worked through that time, so obviously I was on my own. But your mum's and, been amazing, hasn't she? But well, she's so calm. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, a nice one, Christine. Um she's <laughs> she's literally um 
and she doesn't panic. Like, I don't know whether she was like falling apart inside at some point, but she never, she never showed it. So when I was like literally having a meltdown at whichever point I was having a meltdown, whether in NICU or at home or, you know, whatever, she, she never, she was just cute. She was a cool cucumber. She was just like, it's fine. And she'd just like, she'd get up, she'd do a feed. Cause I used to, um, I had post-traumatic stress after having Bobby and part of that was Bobby's feeding because Bobby choked on me in NICU um, when I was feeding him with his milk and he had a really bad choking and it went off and it was just the worst thing ever. You felt like you just literally tried to kill your child. Um, and um, so feeding, getting near feeding time. So you can imagine my baby was feeding every two hours. So you can imagine my anxiety half an hour before feeding time. I was thinking, oh God, I'm going to have to feed him. I have to feed my child. I don't want to feed him. I need to feed him. He needs to grow. And it's like, shit, what if he does this? And it's just like, it was all kind of, it was then things. But my mum, my mum was just like, yeah, you know, she just got on with it. So yeah, um, my mum was a, 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 an amazing rock, really. Um, I'm lucky. Um, so how's Bobby now? Five, so he's five years old now. He's five years old now. Yeah. Like, how did yeah. that happen? How did he go from being this little? I've got, I've got no idea. I, I, I don't. I, I don't know how I belong. Uh, how how I own a five year old. Um, I, I pat myself on the back that he's he's still here. To be honest, that I haven't you know accidentally killed him off. Um, well, you know to be honest. I, I, Sure, there must be a lot of people that do that. Friends of mine from university, Stacey and her husband, they have um, a 10-year-old, well, a 9-year-old, nearly 10. And they, every year, congratulate themselves that they've kept their child alive. And it's yeah, like, yeah. Like, when I do mean, you stop needing to do that? <laughs> the fact that, I mean, Bobby is literally um, like a daredevil, evil can evil, literally puts himself at risk, probably should be a lion tamer when he's older type of chap. <laughs> um, the fact that I have to contend with his constant risk-taking behaviour and I've actually managed to keep him alive um, is, is, is probably an amazing achievement, really. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure whether there's like a, a BAFTA for it or something, but yeah, <laughs> um, you know, the amount of antics that my son's got himself into literally is just, is just, um, yeah, I mean, five years, it's, it's I mean, yeah, it's 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 been it's been eventful. Um, Bobby's um, a wonderful birthday when he just went off that wall and just like just yeah. out of everyone's sight. Yeah. Well, uh, where's Bobby? Like... Yeah, I think I think that was about a two meter drop, and Bobby just jumped over it like it was it. You know, was some kind of action man and got up the other side, brushed himself off, and you know, um, I think. I think Granddad Campbell was was severely telling him off at the other side after giving everybody heart failure. Um, and he just, you know, he wasn't, he got up and walked off. Um, yes, yeah, so Bobby's a very boisterous, happy, comical, um, energetic little soul. Some of the things, so Bobby's severely short-sighted, so Bobby has to wear glasses and we have to go to the eye clinic um regularly Bobby that's also something that is an effect of having been born. yeah so that I think that came from Bobby having something called ROP don't even ask me to say what the full term is retinotherapy of prematurity or something along those lines which basically means because they have oxygen and stuff and things that in NICU it basically can detach the retina and Bobby went to stage three um, um, where if he'd have stayed at stage three, it would have been kind of uh, laser therapy and stuff, but he didn't. He came down to one um, and then got discharged. And then obviously when he was about two, maybe, yeah, maybe about two, probably when he started walking, because he didn't start walking properly till he was about two. So that's when we started noticing things because Bobby was literally just walking to things. He'd be holding things close up. So we started to realise that, potentially there were some eye issues which there were so Bobby now wears glasses permanently. Did you have the same team when you left hospital so you know like we like you have a community midwife that comes out to see you on discharge and things like that so did you have a, a NICU team that came out to see you on discharge? No or? no um I um, had a we had a neonatologist um who stayed with Bobby till I think she stayed with Bobby till Bobby was two and he went over to the community paediatric team. Um, because Bobby had surgery in hospital, he stayed under the surgical team till he was one, I think, and he went for reviews um, for that. Um, 
Bobby has chronic lung disease through prematurity, which is now asthma. So up until I think it was March this year, Bobby was going to see a respiratory consultant at uh, Royal Manchester, but they actually discharged him to be controlled by the community peds team. Uh, he used to see speech and language, um, but because of Bobby's now because of Bobby's behaviour now, they've discharged him because Bobby won't engage. <laughs> he used to see um, a physio um, because Bobby's uh, was extremely clumsy. He, he's very flexible. He's very loose. He's very, you know, he's very. Um, I can't remember the term, but he doesn't see them anymore. Um, again, because he, he won't engage. Um, he just won't participate. So it's it's just a um, thing. Obviously, his eyes, he sees regularly. So he's at Royal Manchester Eye Hospital for his eyes. So he didn't have a specific NICU team. I know there are neonatal nurses, depending on your postcode. It's a bit of a postcode lottery. Um, so there's certain parts where they do get specialist teams. Um, we did have community children's nurse team involved because Bobby's on home oxygen and other stuff um, for a while. So yeah, I mean, but they weren't as a specific team as such yeah it was it was like you were seen by every different department not yeah like yeah yeah I mean I presumably maybe in other areas they may have a dedicated team or if there's, there's other stuff that babies that come out with but yeah Bobby didn't have a, a specific team as, as such so the things where he's been a sort of discharged because he doesn't engage properly does that worry you because I, like, I think I no. <laughs> Well, this is, yeah, this is the difference between us, isn't it? You're great. Like, I, I think I would worry that they hadn't had the treatment that they needed because they were referred to them and they need to see them, but then they're not engaging. So, um, you get better. No, because like, I think that if anybody knows Bobby, uh, you know, like, I mean, if I champion for Bobby and anybody knows that if Bobby needs something, Bobby gets it. So I, I will fight to for now to get it. Bobby's speech has come on so much, you know. Um, he, 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 if people met or saw Bobby through his journey and actually spoke to him now, you kind of think, well, he'll get there. When you have such a complex health and a, a complex needs child like Bobby, actually education and being able to read and write isn't the main be all and end all actually seeing your baby happy and go to school and be happy in his life that's that's what makes me happy um don't get me wrong you know like bobby's got a one-to-one -one. bobby has an educational psychologist you know we'll, we're we've got an educational health care plan but my main thing is that bobby goes to school and is happy you know um nice actually I like, I like that that Actually, you, it's not that you're not using these, these people. These people are out there. These professionals are there. And yes, when they come to you, you will bite the hand off. Oh, yeah. You're not, yeah. You're not sort of obsessing with it yourself at home. You've very much stayed. Because like, I know that you're a professional yourself. You know, yeah. you work in the health service, but you're not bringing that home with you. It's like your job for Bobby is mum and that you need to be a mum. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's the, that, that's the thing. And, and yeah, you know, sometimes I can be, I can be um, vocal and, 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 and install the things that I know that should be happening because I do know the system. What I do for Bobby, somebody might frown at, that's brilliant, but, you know, that's fine, frown about it. You know, I used to get really upset when Bobby had meltdowns in a shop or in a play centre or we were out somewhere because I'd be like, oh God, because everybody would be looking, Bobby would be throwing his clothes everywhere and it just, you just, you stress because, you know, shoes are going everywhere, glasses are going one place, Bobby's going ape, um, people looking at you, you feel like the worst mum ever. But I think, I think now I'm just kind of like, you know. Um, I always remember um, probably a couple of years ago now, you apologizing for sticking an ipad in front of bobby and you saying that it just it really calms him down if he's gonna go and get get on one of his hyper moments and uh, go running around it calms him down it keeps him focused and it gives him something he's very strong will bobby i don't know where he gets it from <laughs> um he's very strong willed he's very headstrong bobby will do what bobby wants to do but obviously bobby needs really strong boundaries he does bother me sometimes but you know if i can give bobby an ipad frown upon me all you want 
and that helps Bobby to refocus and rebalance himself for a minute rather than him spend an hour throwing himself around on the floor or destroying something or hitting himself or hitting me or somebody else that actually I'm going to take the iPad Bobby's up at probably half three four o'clock ready to start his day most mornings um you know if he's not up in the night doing his his antics um you know he, 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 he randomly wakes me up most most nights at probably one two o'clock in the morning to tell me that aliens are coming in the bedroom roof or you know to talk about postman pat or fine and sam or do, what do you think father christmas is doing right now I, I don't know bobby probably sleeping which you should be i don't know um so yeah you know every every day is every day is a bobby day does he like going to school no does <laughs> he not oh no Bobby Bobby Bobby's um I'm dreading September um I think Bobby Bobby likes school to a certain degree Bobby has a one-to-one in school he has a lot of educational support in school I think September's going to be horrendous because Bobby doesn't like boundaries have they ever talked to you have his school ever talked to you about um him not being at that school like is there an alternative for him and would you uh, ever yeah no that? no they, they they don't feel that bobby needs that um at this stage they feel that bobby they can manage bobby's needs in a mainstream school they don't feel that bobby needs to go to a specialist school at this stage which until we get to a point where bobby needs specialist school then i'll keep him in mainstream school unless there is a time when they feel that bobby is unable to be managed He's, he's, he's more intelligent than people give him credit for um, but they adapt very well to being very Bobby led um, you know and he's, he's not daft he's a very intelligent lad is Bobby he's not stupid yeah right? no. he's almost he, like he's, there's communication yes communication might be an issue yes conventional writing and learning to read and whatever might be an issue but it doesn't mean that he's not learning and it doesn't mean that oh no no, Bobby, Bobby will quite happily tell you about dinosaurs. He'll quite happily tell you about the earth and how the earth moves and he'll tell you where honey comes from. You know, I didn't even know Bobby knew that, you know, how honey's made. And, and he, he just comes out with these random, you know, we talked about the solar system. So Bobby learns, and but when it comes to actually being the conventional child that sits and writes his name perfectly or can read or whatever, nah, Bob, that's not Bobby. That's a... Uh- Maybe I'm speaking out of turn here because I've not read any statistics on it, but I think there's a lot more people that are in a similar boat that maybe academically didn't do very well. For example, me, I, I wasn't a very academic person, yet I've got to a place where I use my brain all the time. I've, you know, I've got a very, I've got a good job, I've got a good yeah, career. You um, career yeah. yeah, but I, I was never academic. I've been very practical, but I've never been very academic. Whereas, you know, and I, I don't, I don't want to put that pressure on Bobby. If I can support Bobby with the right qualities to be a good boy, to be a nice boy, to be, you know, be aware of his world and actually use the skills that he has rather than trying to force him to be some sort of, you know, then that's the path that Bobby will take. He's, he's very much ADHD. He's, he's massively, you know, he's, he's got every tick in the box for ADHD. He's very hyper, um, you know, and I have to be very calm with Bobby because it's that borderline where is it, if I get angry with him and I don't try and reason with him, his big red beast comes out. I mean, for any parents out there that are really struggling with children with ADHD and autism, um, you know, recently I've I accessed um the navigate um through scope um and I, I i went there myself i didn't i didn't a professional actually self-referred and i did a six-week course with them um at, over um lockdown i did they, they they did it virtually so i used to have a phone call every thursday where they would send me loads of strategies they'd send me loads of materials and stuff but you know they deal with sleep service they deal with feeding they deal with um, all different types of things that, that, that you know, they, they specify and they get counsellors that, that are for your needs and your child. And it was brilliant. And one of the things that she gave me was something called The Big Red Beast. And it's a book that you can read with your children after they've had a meltdown or they've been, you know, where they've got angry about something to try and teach them to calm that big red beast. And it's, 
it's a really really lovely book and you can watch it on youtube actually there's links like sesame street did different things about feelings about being angry about being sad about being stuff so the sesame street links as well but for anybody that kind of has them problems and their children are on like the autism or or the pathway they can they can access the the free of charge through scope i did a bernardo's course last january actually in 2019 um, and i think that ran for 13 weeks or 12 weeks and that was once a week and, and i sat with parents um, and we talked about behavior and management and bernardo's were amazing when it comes to going to school did school know about bobby's difficulties before he started at the school and was that because of you or was that because they'd had referrals from elsewhere. So when Bobby first got into primary school, obviously his teacher who had previously worked, I mean, we were so lucky to have the teacher that we had with Bobby because she'd worked in special needs previously and she highlighted a lot of things. Now, we did have a transition meeting and, you know, there were some... There were some hiccups. There were some transition issues, let's put it like that there's a lot of different people out there that can help you to transition. You know, there's a service called Sandias that can help you with uh, negotiations with school. They can help you with advice. They can help you with Senko. They can help you with things like that. Again, a very good um, support and, and, and information to tap into um, if you don't feel that you have that confidence as such. I had a question from um, a fellow blogger from Twins and Travels. Um, The lady behind Twins and Travels is Anna. She had children, she had twins at 34 weeks. Yeah, yeah. On um, the end of August. So they're actually going to school now, but she's held them back a year. So instead of them being really, really young in their school year, they'll be, I suppose, slightly too old for their school year, but it'll probably be developmentally a better position. Yeah, I mean... There's a lot of links on Twitter um, and Facebook and stuff like that with people talking about this. And I know somebody um, that was part of something called the PAG, which is Parent Advisory Group, which is something through the hospital where parents can go and talk about the different things that are happening within the NICU units. Um, That's something a bit separate. But I know somebody that was on the PAG team held her son back a year. Um... Yes, I could have done that. I could have, I could have fought to keep Bobby back a year, and probably um, would it have benefited Bobby? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Could I? Could I? Uh, I could have done. I could have. I could have kept Bobby. I mean, when Bobby went to school, where his peers or his or the other children were kind of a uh, kind of forty to sixty months, Bobby was 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 his developmental age in reception was was scoring at sixteen to twenty months. School year this year has been a bit kind of higgledy piggledy because of lockdown and stuff. But Bobby's Bobby's last record, Bobby was then scoring at kind of thirty to. Uh, sorry, 50 to 60, uh, 30 to 50 months or 30 to 60 months. So you can see the development that's come on. So it's been good for it. There's, 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 there's pros and cons to it. And I think that, like I've said before, each child is unique. Each, each parent, the way they parent their child and is new year and what they feel is right for their child. And I think that if mums and dads right to move their children back a year, then then that's 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 their choice to do that. At this stage I don't know if there's benefit to it. I don't know whether it's whether there's whether that works. But if, if that's happy and they feel that their children are better and more equipped from that, then then absolutely because you know, um one of the teams that went to review Bobby in school said it's like you've picked a toddler out of nursery and put them into reception and that's how Bobby is presenting so yeah probably there would have been benefits to keeping Bobby back a year. So what advice Uh, would you give to parents that have um that have children in similar position to Bobby uh, making that transition from nursery to to school particularly having just gone through lockdown? You can do the best you can do, but there's always going to be it. There's always going to be something that's not going to go oh, quite right. And I think, yeah. yeah, and I think you've just got to do the best you can. You know, so Bobby had a little book about who Bobby was. You know, I went into school. We took pictures of the school. I made a book for Bobby so that Bobby knew what the school layout was like. He yeah, went he in before, before school. He went to his yeah, birthday. I arranged, I arranged him that's to go so into great. school and walk around the school and see where his classroom was to meet the people that had been in school. 
Then me and mum put a book together with the photographs that we took so that Bobby could look through them. I took one into nursery so that they could look through the book. We had a meeting. So I went into school. I made, ner- well, nursery came with us. Senko came with us and the school Senko and Bobby's new teacher was there and we talked about Bobby. So there were things that you can do, but I mean, that's me probably going overkill, you know, but, you no, know, there's, there's yeah, lots. I think it's a great, great advice as well, um, a great idea. You know, as you are now, like sort of five years have gone by and you've, you know, you've had your world turned upside down. Um, what words of support would you give to anybody who's just embarking on this? You know, anyone who is literally sat there going, oh, I've got practice in Hicks and I'm only 26 weeks or, you know, what, what? I think, I think, I I think through every time, like, you, you, you know, go with your gut instinct. Don't, um, if you know something's not right, then don't sit there and listen to, you know, X, Y, and Z, who, who's telling you always practice in Hicks because actually, you know, that's not, that's not in the case. Go, go with how you feel. Um, you know, always be honest, always be open. And going through the transition period, you know, don't forget that when you have your child, you know your child better than the professional that's sitting twice, you know. So going through this, this process, you know, people forget yeah, they, they've been to school, that they've, that they've trained, that they can, you know, they can be the best child psychologist, they can be the best paediatric doctor or whatever, but they're not the mummy or the daddy to your baby. Don't ever forget that. You, you know, don't be absorbed by social media and by the perfect family. You know, you, 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 it's wonderful what you have. So don't try and be something or push it into something it doesn't have to be. Be an actual parent. And if you're struggling with that, there's so many services, you know, go to Think in Rochdale, which is a mental health place, go to Bernardo's, go through Scope, speak to your doctor. There's people that can help you. You forget sometimes, I forget that Bobby's a little person that picks up when mum is sad or mum is unhappy or mum is having stress. And, and then you wonder why he has like 10 meltdowns that day. It, it can be a very hard and lonely journey sometimes. And I think that if anything, just don't sit there in silence and struggle and think that you're being a bad parent or think why is this happening to me because actually it's probably happening to 40 other parents out there 50 other parents 100 other parents that are sitting there having exactly the same conversation that you're having I think that I think that's a lot of it the point of doing this um hang on a second I know come and sit my sorry I've got to my yeah. not one anymore <laughs> I could hear like from in my room I shut the door and I could still hear you Sorry, we'll we'll try and quieten down. We're nearly done. <laughs> what did what were we just talking about? Because like, um, about parents not suffering in silence. Yes, sorry. Right. Okay. So go back to where we were. Yeah. So I think that was really the point of this Zoom call, isn't it? To yeah. show people there. You you're not speaking as a professional. You're not speaking as uh, somebody that is offering advice and you should do this you should do that you're just speaking as a mum who's been through it and somebody who's been through it and yeah. if that helps people sat at home that are also going through it then that that's the purpose of this whole thing it is spreading awareness uh, that that it happens and you know and it happens more than we actually think that it is happening and and don't linger on it yeah. i suppose you know, because it'll it'll drive you mad. <laughs> I'll end up like me. <laughs> well, crazy. <laughs> oh, no. Can I just say thank you, literally. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're a great friend. You're an absolute crackpot. Like, yeah, just, total mental case. <laughs> like, but you've just been, like, you are so strong. I don't think you give yourself anywhere near the amount of credit that you should for everything you've been through. You're just a tower of strength. You're there for other people but um yeah no so i just want to say a great big thank you that's all right thanks for asking me to do this telling us your story yeah no it's all right thanks for thanks for asking